It is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Tori Luft, a research microbiologist at the USDA National Animal Disease Center in Ames, Iowa, or how I like to call it, the Disneyland of infectious disease work. <laughs> Dr. Luft completed his BS and MS at Bowling Green State University, followed by his PhD at Iowa State University, where he focused on swine microbiomes and the effects of antibiotic feed additives on goat microbes. Since 2013, he has overseen research at the USDA ARS, focusing on the ecology of antibiotic resistance genes in poultry microbiomes, microbiota succession after hatch, and interactions between the microbiome and pathogens like Salmonella and Campylobacter. Dr. Luff also holds an adjunct assistant professorship at Iowa State University, where he has contributed to microbiology education since 2014. His long-term goal is to reduce Campylobacter and Salmonella carriage in poultry, helping to decrease human foodborne disease from contaminated food products. Please. Help me welcome Dr. Luth. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, Erica, for the invitation and the, the wonderful introduction. Um, it's my first time here. It's beautiful coming in, uh, flying in. The trees are all changing. It's, it's really, it was really fun to see. And you know, walking around campus, it's a pretty, pretty campus. So I hope to, to get to see more. Um, you don't have to leave. You could just stay. <laughs> Do you have an extra bed at your place? Sure. No problem. Or the chickens. Chickens are still at home. But uh, yes, I'm a, a research microbiologist at the National Animal Disease uh, Laboratory. Um, uh, a lot of the research there focuses on animal health issues. Uh, our research in our unit is a food safety and tariff pathogens research unit. And so we, we focus mostly on poultry foodborne pathogens such as Campylobacter and Salmonella, uh, swine pathogens, uh, which is really Salmonella and understanding antibiotic resistance and then e, uh, e. coli and cattle. And so collectively we, we focus on all these different foodborne pathogens pre-harvest while these animals are still on the farm to uh, reduce colonization. So ARS is interested in um, uh, antibiotic resistance. Uh, so ARS is the branch of USDA that we belong to. It's Agricultural Research Services. And they recently updated their research strategy to discuss their main emphasis on uh, different aspects of antibiotic resistance research. Um, and this is specifically understanding the risk, uh, diagnostic strategies, mitigation strategies, and scientific outreach. Uh, because we do a lot of microbiome studies and on-farm studies, we really focus on risk, trying to understand how um, antibiotic resistance is mobilized and can be acquired by uh, foodborne pathogens. And so uh, because uh, it's, it's really a gut uh, microbiome project, you have to understand sort of the composition of the microbiome, um, you know, how succession changes, and, you know, specifically what your, your host system is. And so we work in the avian gut of uh, both chickens and turkeys. Um, and you know, the avian gut's a little different than the mammalian gut. You have the small intestine, you have the duodenum, jejunum, and ilium. Uh, but the, the cica are, uh, they come off the, the, like the distal end of the, the ilium. You have these two sort of dead end sacs that uh, bacterial fermentation occurs. And so this is like a densely colonized uh, compartment in the intestinal tract. Uh, we generally focus our studies in this like, cecal environment. Uh, because if you're looking at Campylobacter or Salmonella, this is often where it's most dense. Also, it's where the fermentation of the, of the commensals is most important for animal health. Um, there are other factors to consider in thinking about uh, the composition of the microbiota. Uh, you have host factors, such as the spatial distribution, as I was saying, that it can, can you know, have different specializations of different gut compartments and different bacterial uh, species that live in those different compartments. Uh, succession is a big driver of change in the gut, and so you have uh, birds that hatch. They have pretty much no bacteria in the gut, um, and they start acquiring things environmentally, and so that changes a lot with time. And so understanding how that succession can drive the composition is important, and understanding uh, you know what the risks are at different ages. There are intervention strategies we've uh, we've uh, um, explored as far as modulating the microbiota. You know, there's metabolites you can directly feed to uh, to animals, you know, antibiotics to modulate the composition of the bacteria, uh, then pre prebiotics and probiotics also to improve performance. So uh, in understanding some of the knowledge gaps that we're trying to address, uh, we 
we'll, uh, we've identified some things that we think we can make progress on. Um, understanding how and when horizontal gene transfer can happen in the gut is, is one of these uh, areas that we want to focus on. Specifically, we'd like to characterize plasmids and antibiotic resistance genes that can be acquired from commensal organisms by foodborne pathogens such as salmonella. Um, I'm going to highlight one study here uh, discussing uh, one of our salmonella studies. And so to do that, we had a uh, salmonella enterica cerevar Heidelberg strain that was uh, pretty much susceptible to a lot of the antibiotics we we're interested in. Uh, we made analodixic acid resistance so that we could easily culture it from uh, you know, the, the bacterial background in the gut. And so we're looking to see if uh, this susceptible salmonella uh, when colonizing birds can acquire uh, any antibiotic resistance phenotypes in vivo. And so this study uh, just kind of summarized the design here. Uh, we had, uh, this is a collaboration with uh, Ade Al Aladiende. Uh, he's a research microbiologist down in Athens, Georgia, also USDA. And so uh, uh, he did uh, a lot of this work as well. Uh, but we collaborated on, on this goal to understand how this uh, um, salmonella strain after challenging birds can um, um, acquire antibiotic resistance. Uh, Ade uh, specifically was exploring different uh, routes of inoculation. He was looking at oral, cloacal, and cedar bird type uh, ways to colonize birds. So, um, you know, oral gavage uh, is obvious. Cloacal gav uh, gavage is another way that you can uh, inoculate with salmonella. And then the cedar bird model where you inoculate like five birds, I think in this example, and you co-house them with other birds. This is like a more natural way of colonization. Birds are copr coprophagic, and so they can get exposed to um, other bacteria that way. And so specifically, we're interested in um, uh, if these salmonella isolates acquire plasmids conferring antibiotic resistance. Um, and I guess to uh, jump to the conclusion, yes, we did see a transfer of antibiotic resistance. Um, we uh, identified a commensal E. coli population as the, the likely reservoir of these antibiotic resistance genes. Um, specifically, we saw these, uh, these ink I1 plasmids, some different types with uh, some variation in it that was acquired. Uh, this is a summary of two trials uh, that uh, was, were done. Uh, trial one showed very little resistance acquisition by the salmonella. Tr trial two, uh, we had about 40% of the salmonella recovered that had acquired resistance. Um, of those that uh, had acquired resistance, uh, we see from different inoculation sources, uh, oral gavage is the, the, the most abundant, coical and cedar bird uh, uh, routes of inoculation also, um, you know, to a lesser extent. Um, for the most part, we saw ampicillin resistance and uh, aminoglycoside resistance and tetracycline resistance uh, in these plasmids that were acquired. So we used uh, high C uh, metagenomics to try to identify the potential donor. And so uh, if, if some of you may be familiar with high C, it's, it's been around a number of years. It's uh, sort of this like cross-linking method uh, to try to identify interactions uh, with pieces of DNA while they're still within the cell. And so the way it sort of works is uh, before the bacteria are lysed um, and popped open, uh, you cross-link the DNA. So everywhere there are interactions between pieces of DNA um, uh, within the cell, those uh, cross-link, and then there's a, a ligation and circular, circularization process that happens. So you can then sequence sort of two pieces of DNA at once that appear in different parts of the genome. This helps facilitate assembly, so you can then generate these um, metagenomic uh, assembled genomes or MAGs, so that you have higher confidence that, that these things are co-occurring within the cell. And the results suggested that it was an E. coli that had these same plasma types that we we're identifying uh, in our salmonella. We also isolated uh, tetracycline resistant um, E. coli on McConkie with TET from the study and uh, confirmed with in vitro mating that the plasma that was present in those uh, E. coli could also be transferred to uh, the salmonella. So uh, we're able to see it as well in vitro uh, as well as in the animal. We've uh, done this study in a couple other forms uh, to try to understand different aspects of it. Um, we've tried uh, using feed additives to drive the, the selection for or the acquisition of antibiotic resistance genes like bacitracin or elevated dietary zinc. Um, but in all cases, those don't seem to uh, give us any difference in the acquisition of the AMR genes by salmonella. And in fact, in all cases, before we started the feed additive, we already were observing TET uh, um, acquisition. And so for that reason, we were focusing on tetracycline because 
we were seeing it so uh, so quickly transferred to the salmonella. So we still have uh, things that we don't know about what's occurring, such as where are these donors coming from? You know, are they coming from the environment? Are they coming from the hatchery and they're on the eggshell? Uh, because perhaps if we can identify some of these reservoirs of antibiotic resistance genes, we can try to eliminate them to minimize the risk of transfer to salmonella. And so we did a couple studies looking at uh, egg sources of, of bacteria to see if we can isolate or identify the egg versus the environment as a potential reservoir and source for these microbes. And so we used piglet uh, notobiotic isolators uh, that we had on site at NADC and we sort of retrofitted them to do egg work. And so uh, we took isolators that look like this and we hatched uh, eggs in there. Uh, in doing that, we were trying to uh, eliminate any environmental inputs into the microbiota development of the birds uh, because the eggs were not disinfected, but the environment was sterilized with like chlorine dioxide gas. And so we could hatch the eggs, they could grow in there, or the, bird, the chicks would grow, and their microbiota would develop, but any uh, bacteria that would colonize would have had to have come from the eggshell surface because the environment was otherwise sterile. Similarly, we took uh, eggs and sterilized them with chlorine dioxide and acidified bleach, raised them in a conventional setting so they only had environmental bacteria, and so this would then evaluate whether or not that's the, the, the source for some of these donor organisms. Uh, and then we compared that to conventional eggs uh, that are conventionally hatched. So this is a little schematic of the design. So, uh, you know, we had these four groups. Uh, we had, uh, so N is like normal egg sterile environment. So these are the isolators. And so, you know, we took uh, these, these conventional eggs in the sterilized environment. We hatched them. Uh, we uh, euthanized uh, about 12 uh, before we gave them salmonella to get a baseline of their microbiota. Uh, they were given salmonella, uh, 10 to the fourth uh, CFUs per mil. Um, and then we did uh, necropsies at day 8, 13, and 26 um, after hatch. Uh, we had a control group here that didn't receive salmonella just to make sure our birds were coming in with, uh, or the eggs didn't have salmonella present already. Um, we had a, a normal egg environment, uh, a normal uh, uh, environment, conventional environment, but these did receive salmonella, so these would have both the, the egg source of bacteria as well as the environmental source. And then we had sterile eggs in a natural environment also got uh, salmonella. And so we could use those different conditions to try to figure out if it was coming from either place. So uh, we did get good colonization, a little variable between the different treatment groups. These are the two necropsies post salmonella infection. Unfortunately, plating on McConkey with TET, we didn't observe transfer of TET resistance uh, to our salmonella like we had done in about four previous studies. And so that was disappointing. Um, so we did it again, and we also failed to see transfer this time or that time or this time. So two times it failed. So uh, we were also plating for um, TET resistant E. coli in that study. So we were plating on McConkey auger uh, with tetracycline, and we were getting TET resistant E. coli present but we weren't getting transfer. So we investigated sort of what was happening. Um, we screened a number of isolates uh, uh, with the same in, in vitro mating uh, uh, conjugation uh, protocol that we had previously used and observed transfer. And we could not get the TET resistance to transfer to our salmonella strain. And so we sequenced all of them and found that um, all but three had uh, uh, the TET resistance chromosomally encoded, so very likely low uh, rate of transfer could be occurring if it's on the chromosome and not on a plasmid. The three that had it on a plasmid had an, an ink H1B plasmid, uh, which we don't typically see. And, and looking at the plasmid, it's actually la lacking like the, the transfer genes that would be acquired or required to easily move uh, to the salmonella. So it's probably a pretty low frequency event. Maybe it requires like a helper plasmid or something. So we think this explains why we weren't observing it in these two studies. Um, and so uh, this, this highlights, I guess, the understanding that the context matters uh, for uh, how these antibiotic resistance genes exist in the natural populations in the gut, because um, you know, the, the, the risk of transfer isn't always the same just because it's present. And so um, uh, these, these, I guess, kind of, Conclusions show the same thing I just said, you know, that salmonella could be a good uh, sentinel for acquisition of antibiotic resistance genes. Um, you know, the commensals may act as a reservoir, but that, that context matters. Um, and so 
we're, we're interested if we're, uh, there are windows during the microbiota succession, the salmonella risk, whether it be antibiotic uh, acquisition or antibiotic resistance acquisition or uh, colonization is higher. Um, and so we're, we're focusing on that as well. So um, thinking about the, the succession of the microbiota and you know, how birds are hatched conventionally, the eggs are, are generally disinfected. And if you get these eggs that are disinfected at like a hatchery, um, it's very difficult to get any bacteria to grow. Uh, they're, they're essentially sterile. And so that would mean that all of the, the bacteria that are, being, uh, are colonizing chicks are really coming from the environment. And that could be the feed, you know, housing environment, other interactions, uh, and all of that you know, contributes to what is in the microbiota of a mature animal. So the ability for salmonella to colonize is not uh, the same throughout an animal, uh, a chicken's life. And so um, richness does, does go up, diversity goes up as birds get older. So this is a, a plot that shows observed like goes use over days of life, and you see that it, it trends up. Uh, you get more richness as birds get older. And that's negatively correlated with salmonella colonization. Uh, so salmonella um, doesn't colonize birds as well when there's more of a rich microbiota. Um, and so that could be uh, correlated to age or uh, by uh, richness as well. And so anecdotally, we also have uh, the same observation. If you are doing an infection study with salmonella and you you want to inoculate a day old bird, you can use a very low inoculum. Um, but if you're gonna go like a week out or something, you have to increase the, the amount of bacteria you're giving them by quite a bit uh, to get it to colonize. And so um, we think that there's competition uh, occurring with the microbiota and perhaps uh, you know, reducing that window that salmonella can colonize well could be a way to reduce salmonella. So, you know, can, can this approach of competitive exclusion be used to uh, exclude salmonella? Um, it, it's already been done uh, actually for decades. Uh, people have been using undefined products, uh, you know, uh, taking sequel contents from a mature bird, like a six month old bird, giving it to a, a newly hatched chick actually is really effective at preventing salmonella colonization. And so, um, you know, this might occur from different, different mechanisms. It could be a reduction of nutrients. It could be like physical, you know, blocking of the space, but there, there could be different mechanisms. There's also the, this like NERMI concept, which uh, was developed a few decades ago as well, where you can take like feces or sequel contents from a mature, a mature animal, um, do like an overnight culture in broth, and then give that back to like a chick and, and effectively prevent salmonella from colonizing. And so here are some of the proposed mechanisms. You can have the you know, competition uh, from biological exclusion, physical exclusion, chemical, chemical exclusion. So this would be like you know, um, antimicrobial peptides or like bacteriosins or something that are being produced versus like you know, competition for nutrients. And so there could be some different mechanisms at play. So there are, this, is, this is a product available in Europe. Um, but there are some problems with using such a like an undefined thing that comes from like total sequel contents. Um, you know, specifically there are regulatory issues in the U.S. Um, it cannot be used for uh, you know some of these treatments if it's undefined because you may have safety issues. You may have um, you know batch to batch variation. Uh, there's no clear mechanism, and so a lot of researchers in human health and in animal health have been exploring the idea of using defined communities to capture some of uh, the aspects of the undefined uh, product uh, without the, the regulatory problems or the you know, safety concerns associated with the, uh, uh, the undefined product. And so Carmen Wickware is a postdoc in our lab. Um, they've been working on this and, and doing a great job at uh, uh, developing this idea into uh, you know, something that we've tested experimentally. Um, and so we're going to continue to look at the same strain, uh, this uh, um, 2813 salmonella, to evaluate, um, uh, you know, to find community whether or not we can prevent colonization. So our initial stab at this was sort of like a, a, a subjective selection of, of bacteria based on diversity. So we have a large culture collection in our lab of commensal organisms, and since we have seen and, and it's in the literature that um, Commensals from mature uh, microbiota from chickens seem to uh, prevent colonization. We tried to maximize the 
taxonomic diversity in selecting these organisms. We cherry picked sort of representative members of different taxonomic groups to try to assemble them into a 15 strain uh, consortium and you know, see if that would uh, reduce salmonella colonization. So here's a little, oh, there were like lines there, but, um, but that's okay. Um, so this is like our timeline. And so basically we hatched birds uh, on site. So we got eggs, we hatched them. Um, after they hatched, uh, they were given our, our bacterial inoculum. So we had control birds that just had uh, sterile PBS. And then we had our defined community. Uh, we standardized that at uh, like 10 to the seventh cells uh, per mil. And uh, each of each of the members of the community were added at a equal equal concentration, and then we took sequel contents uh, pooled from a number of six month old chickens. They were also, uh, as best we could, standardized to that ten to the seventh level. Um, so we euthanized ten birds uh, about a week after they were inoculated with each of these treatments, um, and then inoculated with salmonella, ten to the eighth uh, CFUs per mil. Um, and then we did necropsies at three days, 14 days, and 28 days to monitor the, the, the effect of, of these treatments on salmonella colonization. So we did see a change in the salmonella uh, shedding or, or the salmonella colonization. And so you can see our two groups here, CT is the control, uh, DC is the defined community, and CC are the birds that receive the sequel contents. Uh, day three, uh, after, three days after um, salmonella inoculation, we definitely don't have uh, salmonella in our, our sequel content receiving birds. So our, our sort of control is working the way others have reported it to do. So we're pretty pleased with that. Um, we don't see any protection. If, if anything, this is a little worse, our, um, our defined group versus our control. And so we, we're not seeing any protection. By day 14, we do start to see a reduction in that defined community group. And then um, by day 28, we see uh, even more so a reduction. So our control group uh, stayed fairly elevated uh, throughout. Um, this is our sort of uh, threshold for um, direct plating. So these are all direct plated on salmonella chromoger uh, with naladixic acid and novobiosin, which our strain is resistant to. And then um, if it's negative by direct plating, but we can get it by enrichment. You know, this is our threshold. And then if it's negative by direct plating and negative by enrichment, we're, we're down here with, with these numbers. And so uh, the sequel contents is working quite well. Um, we are getting some protection with this defined group, but not as, not as good as we would uh, hope for the, the sequel content group. So we think there's room for improvement. Look at, looking at the microbiota composition, this is, uh, you know, beta diversity, this ordination shows like the, the sort of similarities between the communities. Um, I guess to start here with the sequel content receiving group, uh, we have um, really no change with age. And so uh, you can see as these birds get older, um, that sequel contents where they received the community from a mature animal uh, didn't really change. I guess that's not surprising because, you know, they already are, are colonized with that, that diverse community. Uh, but we do see, you know, sort of a succession change with age with both uh, the control and the defined group. I presume if we had gone longer, you know, these might converge, but we do see, you know, sort of a trend, you know, as they change as, and, and get older. Um, we also did transcriptomics of uh, the sequel mucosa to see if there's an effect of the microbial modulation on, uh, on the host gene expression. Um, I'll, try to be brief with like some of the differences because it's like a lot of data. Um, but here are some of the, the main differences between the defined group and the uh, control and the sequel content receiving group with the control. Um, we have um, a lot of genes actually differentially expressed in the defined uh, sequel mucosa early in the study and sort of diminishes with age. And then the opposite is true with uh, the birds that receive the, the sequel contents. The chicken genome is, is not super well annotated. And so probably half these genes are not annotated um, and even fewer of them, you know, are, are part of like, you know, um, better studied pathways. Um, in trying to simplify the data, we also looked at sort of go terms or these gene ontology groups. Um, because we lose a lot of the data though, you have to you know, take it with a grain of salt, but we do see some of the comparisons that had enriched pathways uh, just to highlight. Um, really just these three comparisons. So day zero, you know, the defined group to the control and then 14 and 28 days, uh, the sequel content receiving birds and the controls. 
And so, um, you know, at, at day zero, you know, the immune system is not very developed to birds. And so not surprising, we didn't see as much uh, immunological difference uh, in, in these pathways. Um, but by day 14 in the sequel treated groups, we do see a number of, you know, homeostasis genes, you know, signaling their transporters, uh, T of B cell signaling. Uh, so, so the microbial treatment is, is having some effect, we think, on, on post-gene expression, perhaps development. Looking at the specific genes, uh, these are just a subset of uh, the annotated genes. So the annotated genes, these are the top 40 for each comparison. Uh, we do see some trends. I'll just highlight a couple because it's a little difficult to digest this. So we see uh, transport and cell signaling genes uh, by day zero and day three up in the, in the defined group. So you can see here uh, the purple are the sequel contents uh, group and then the, the um, Teal is, uh, is, is the um, defined group. And so, and then these are each of our different necropsies. And so day zero and day three, uh, we have an increase in some of these, these groups. And then day 28, they're actually the opposite trend. And so this is like a zoom in of that same heat map just to highlight some of those genes. Uh, and so we have transport genes that are differentially expressed. And so um, we have got like solute carriers, you know, ion, ion transporters, things like that. And so, uh, things that might relate to, you know, what's going on in the lumen of the gut, perhaps, um, but, you know, it's, it's still early for us to, to say much about it other than we're observing these, these changes. Um, we see transport and structural genes down in the defined group and the sequel group relative to the control group. And so, you know, perhaps uh, these uh, are worth exploring in the future. We see transporters for butyrate actually down um, and then, you know, signaling ones. And then uh, structural genes like, you know, uh, poor forming claudins, you know, differentially expressed right there. And so these are all down actually by 28 days relative to the control group. Similarly, we see a lot of immunological genes, uh, genes associated with inflammation that are differentially expressed. Uh, in general, we see a lot of these pro-inflammatory genes down in, uh, in the defined group um, early. And then uh, again, late in the study. And so we see some of these down. We zoom in, it's like a lot of genes here. So uh, just kind of big picture, we see these inflammation and immune related genes that are down, you know, sort of in these later time points. And then these early time points, you know, comparing to the controls. And yeah, immunometabolism genes, uh, you know, other things that might be of interest down the road for us to explore and transporters. And so these uh, specifically, I want to highlight these uh, pro-inflammatory genes uh, that are down uh, with our treatment. And so uh, at least in other animal models, uh, you know, people know that salm salmonella does respond to sort of that inflammation. Um, and so it's interesting to note that we see these different as well. So our goal now is to try to uh, understand um, you know, our composition of our defined community, um, but what can we do when looking at the um, reduction of salmonella in the, in the sequel contents to make it better? And so that's a goal we're focusing on. And so we are um, sequencing genome, the genomes of uh, all the commensals in our collection, focusing on the ones that are isolated from older birds. And we're, our goal is to maximize the, the functional overlap with our commensal a pool that we want to give to birds with the, the functional needs of salmonella. The idea being that, you know, if we can, you know, make our, our defined community most competitive against salmonella, perhaps that will be the most effective way at reducing salmonella colonization. And we're going to use a genomic sort of predictive approach to go about doing that. And so we um, are, we built a, a database of salmonella genomes that had host specific information that we could then you know, uh, cater to sort of these chicken associated salmonella genomes uh, to maximize uh, those as our target for uh, competition. Uh, so we got the RefSeq genomes. Uh, we, you know, did the gene prediction, uh, uh, predicted uh, uh, or annotated with like Uniprot. And then we have this uh, gene ontology count table that sort of uh, encompasses all these genomes that we're able to like pull into this database. And then for each of our queries, you know, our, our commensal organisms that we're trying to uh, evaluate for inclusion into uh, a, a potential new defined community, we're taking the sequence, essentially running it through the same um, uh, pipeline. Of course, we'll, we'll have to, you know, sequence and assemble 
um, will you know, have to use a, a general bacterial annotator, but uh, the goal is to then compare these, um, these gene ontology groups so we can maximize like uh, carbohydrate utilization pathways and perhaps like things like lipid pathways so we can increase the competition and perhaps you know, that's a, a way we could get more out of the defined community. And so it'll be like sort of an iterative approach we will, um, you know, look at our, our data set, um, you know, we'll compare the, the, the gene list and the pathway list, um, but uh, we may have to dig in the literature a little bit to identify metabolites that are known to be critical for salmonella colonization and make sure that we have members in our community that can target that um, as far as, uh, um, you know, competition. So uh, to conclude that, um, you know, we under, um, you know, improved understanding of salmonella interactions with members of the microbiota will inform uh, these kinds of decisions. Um, you know, the defined community has potential, uh, but we need to improve it if we want to get the kind of uh, prevention of colonization that we observed with um, um, the, the sequel contents. Um, you know, the, the microbial alterations with either the sequel contents or the defined community uh, may modulate uh, animal health. Uh, and so we need to think about the consequences of that. You know, are we, are we improving health or are we harming it? You know, birds uh, develop with this simple microbiota when they first hatch. Um, and, you know, there could be some consequences in putting too much diversity in there too soon. Uh, we may be able to prevent salmonella, but it could come at a production cost and will producers use it? Um, similarly, thinking about producers using it, we have to consider whether or not um, we have a, a, a thing that could be easily applied in uh, a real world situation. So do we need to prioritize you know, spore formers or microaerophilic type organisms that can um, uh, you know, survive the environment and survive the application whether that be spraying eggs hatch, <laughs> putting it in water, spraying chicks after they hatch. You know, these are all things that we, we might have to consider in thinking about organisms to include. Um, but the sequel contents did, you know, provide good protection. So we feel confident that uh, if we can maybe um, uh, mirror more aspects of, of that composition, perhaps we can, we can improve our defined community. Uh, we did get a reduction by 28 days, but nowhere, as dr nowhere near as dramatic as with the sequel contents. So that's, that's all I have. Uh, a number of people uh, worked really hard on this project, uh, a series of, uh, of postdocs, Cassidy, Benina, and Carmen, and Randy, um, you know, did a lot of the work. Uh, I have a graduate student, Dylan, who is, who is also uh, involved in selecting different organisms for both Campylobacter and Salmonella inhibition. Um, and I've collaborated a lot with uh, AMR studies with uh, Ade down in Athens, Georgia. And so, um, Looks like we have a lot of time. So, um, you know, if you have questions, I'm happy to try to answer them. Thank you. Well, first question normally is from our trainees. So, yeah, I was curious. So, for your defined community in the initial experiments where you're looking at salmonella abundance and the CFUs, so you did get some reduction over the course of the experiment. And like by 28 days, you had kind of the most reduction, but you also had the most variability in the abundance of salmonella. Uh, do you have any thoughts as to why that may have happened? So you're talking about the later time point has like high shutters and low shutters, let's call them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. we're actually really curious about that. Uh, Carmen is actually, um, they looked at the, gene expression profiles between the, those animals that were high shutters and low shutters and couldn't find a difference. And so now they're looking at the uh, microbiota composition to see if there's any um, differences in the organisms that could you know, suggest that they're involved in it. And so um, the, the sort of high shutter, low shutter observation with salmonella um, also exists in swine. I was part of a, a swine study a few years ago that they also were observing the same thing. You can correlate certain taxa with it, you know, but um, I guess the real question is, can you um, you predict an organism that, or a, a, an animal that is going to be a high shutter or low shutter by knowing if, if they have this certain bug or a you know, certain percentage of it? So uh, yeah, I don't have an answer to that, but it's a good question. It's something that we thought when we saw it as well, you know, why why are these so low and why are these so high? And you know, there, there must be 
some host factors or microbiome factors that are that are contributing to that. Thank you. Did you do any metabolites uh, study to see um, which metabolites are playing, if they are playing something? Metabolites? Yeah, if they are playing something on the resistance of yeah. this monologue. Yeah, that's, that's also a good question. We did not, um, you know, honestly, we weren't sure if it would work at all. And so, um, you know, we, we want to dig a little deeper and try to understand what the mechanism is. And so we are planning another study with a, a modified community and we want to compare the old one, the new one, and look at different servars to see how broad the protection could be. And so uh, understanding, uh, yeah, what the bacteria are actually doing, what the, what the metabolites are, I think would be important. And so it'll probably, probably be like, we'll just collect samples and freeze them back so that we have at least the option based on what we observe with the salmonella data. So we could decide if it's if it's worth our effort to, to try to like profile the different metabolites. Um, we generally like look at short chain fatty acids, uh, but we don't really go beyond that. And so uh, that could be important. Thanks. Um, I had a question about like the length of the study. Like when you were talking about you just stopped at 28 days. I don't know exactly how like if these are poultry chickens like used for eating I guess mm -hmm. the, but I don't know how long they live in like typical slaughter day but have you thought about prolonging it up to the point of like when they actually would be slaughtered and then move on for consumers yeah yeah that is important to think about because salmonella at the time of slaughter is really where the risk is and so um, you know reducing it through the animal's life is important but if if you could reduce right before slaughter that's the most effective way Typically for like, you know, cost and time, uh, we, we typically shorten them, you know, broilers are, are, I think, six weeks before slaughter, you know, so they don't live super long. Um, and so this, we were focusing on what we thought was this window that we could observe, you know, a change in the microbiota uh, to detect the difference in the salmonella. Um, we have done uh, actually turkey studies where we take them farther out, um, closer to slaughter, uh, but you know, they're just, it gets it gets pricey. They eat a lot, you know. They get they're they're really hungry, and they you know space limitations also as they get larger. And so often we'll try to answer the question in a shorter study if we can, uh, but sometimes the, the there is a need to take it all the way out. And you know uh, we'll we'll certainly have to consider that uh, if if the goal is to yeah have little to no salmonella at time of slaughter, which is important. Um. Here in the US, we work a lot with reused litter, right? So have you tested or do you expect any differences in your treatment if you're using chickens that are placed at reused litter? Would that be any, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, so reused litter, um, I was on a study with Adia a few years ago. Uh, we looked at reused litter as, as a, um, a way to, reduce salmonella colonization and it, and it does work up to an extent. And so birds like that are on new litter definitely colonize uh, with sal salmonella at a higher level than with used litter. Um, it doesn't prevent salmonella, but I, I do think that the microbes that they're exposed to do contribute maybe to the, the reduction that is observed. Um, but you're asking how the reused litter could complicate the application of, of such a thing. Um, I don't know. I think at the time that they would be getting exposed to uh, um, a defined community it would probably be immediately post hatch. And I don't believe they're on litter yet at that point. Um, and so it may not make a difference. Um, I guess the goal would be if you if they're shedding that, you know, perhaps they can yeah, be inoculating each other since they are coprophagic. But I haven't really thought beyond that how how the, the litter conditions could impact it. So, um, you know, I think that highlights just a general Point, which is, you know, the experimental conditions sometimes don't mimic the like the actual producers' conditions, and, and sometimes you um, observe something, but it doesn't translate to something that would work in their setup. And so, yeah, doing our best to try to mimic it is is we can only do so much. Our like spaces are pristine, you know, it's disinfected between animals, and you know, it's it's really not a, a situation that is similar to what a, a chicken would typically be grown in so um that that is a limitation of you know some of the controlled work that we do in like an infectious lab 
So um, I'm really fascinated. Have you looked at implantation of the synthetic community members and whether or not that could explain some of the bimodal outcome in that shed or non shedder stuff? Yeah. So our um, our community did colonize like by 16s data, if, if that's what you mean. We don't have like selective media for some of these bugs, but we can see like a big difference in the in the, in the species at the young age. And so so there is a difference. You know, I don't know. Um, I don't know if we can yeah, say if that's responsible for the difference, um, but you know there is definitely a, a different composition, and and so it could be difficult to to know yeah whether or not uh, um, you know how that's contributing to some of those observations, but um, yeah uh, they're they're there, um, but um, you know their their relative abundance diminishes as they get older as the, some of the other commensals start to increase in density. Um, and I guess one observation uh, about the samples from this study, you know, we've been focused very much on the on the richness and the composition, but there could also just be like a, a sum of the biomass of like the density of like all the organisms. Um, Carmen observed when extracting the DNA from the birds that had received the sequel contents, there's like three times as much total DNA in those samples relative to the others. And so you know, it, it, it could have less to do about the, the, the diversity. It could just be that there's so much in such a small space and, and that's also limiting the colonization potential. And so that's another one of the things that we wanna try to incorporate into future studies, perhaps two um, different inocula doses, inoculum doses uh, that, you know, like 10 to the seventh and maybe like 10 to the ninth or something and see if, if that, you know, contributes to any differences as well. Um, so there's like a lot of, a lot of variables that are, you know, tough to know how critical they are in, in predicting the outcome, but I think they are all worth exploring. And if I may ask a counterintuitive question, have you considered instead of adding more organisms, adding less? Yeah, um, we haven't actually. Um, and so, you know, I would expect they'd colonize just because the, the gut is pretty empty at that point. What do you think would happen? Well, I think if you have a set of organisms, let's say 15, maybe there is in fact some subset that is suppressing um, salmonella, but that doesn't mean that they necessarily all do. And so if you remove organisms that lack those antagonistic relationships or might even have synergistic relationships, you maybe you could see the activity of the, uh, shall we say, the workers of that. Yeah, community. okay. Yeah, that, that would be interesting to see, um, especially do, does, yeah, the inocula, matter like how much how many cells are there you know perhaps it still like you know balances out um yeah good idea yeah. <laughs> going back to the plasmid story you have the donor and recipient plasmid identified were there any genetic changes between the two mutations deletions? between um the the, plasmids that transferred um i don't recall if we identified any snips uh, or any rearrangements uh, um yeah certainly nothing that it stood out that we discussed. And then it, is there a fitness benefit to having that plasmid there outside is. of the antibiotic resistance hypothesis? There is. There's, um, I did some work with uh, one of the plasmids looking at acid tolerance. And so um, identified uh, um, acid tolerance as, as a benefit of having the plasmid. And then the, the, the TET uh, containing plasmids off, often have, I think in all cases actually in our, our study, had uh, zinc tolerance and zinc is often added as an antimicrobial sort of an alternative to antibiotics and diet. And so, you know, that is likely if they're co-housed on a single mobile genetic element, you know, you could have selection for one and something else kind of comes along for the ride. Thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I have a technical question and then I want to kind of follow up with that is, did you have any issues with the high seek um, with your host background? We do not have any issues with the high seek host background. Um, mostly it was like computationally a pain and expensive. And so I probably will go to it again, mm -hmm. but um, there was no host background issues that um, uh, we were using SQL contents. You know, while there's gonna be some slough cells, it was just really microbially dense, so. And then my question that's related more to the plasmid question, did you see, um, in addition to like the zinc tolerance or acid tolerance, 
Did you ever see any um, like host pathogenicity islands being transferred from? I do not. I'm still hung up on why can like why does the SQL content work and the inoculum doesn't? And I have some technical questions in terms of how did you prepare and deliver the SQL contents and the defined community? Because I'm trying to get at maybe the bacteria are happy playing with each other and making metabolites that would then make the defined community being wrapped better if they got co-cultured or did you culture them separately? And then like, how did you do that? Yeah, I have a, I have a colleague, Chris Anderson, who has pitched that idea a number of times. I think there's a manuscript that uh, he shared with me a couple years ago or a year ago that they showed, I think, co-culturing a defined community together made them more fit to be inoculated together. Is that sort of what you're referencing? Yeah, because I think your co-culture, your defined community is just about your cells, right? Yes. That you're putting in there is not a lot of metabolite. No, we actually use. spin them down and suspend them in PBS. And so, uh, and we do the same for the, the SQL contents, but um, that's really just to standardize the inoculum because we have different concentrations of cells and, and so we enumerate them and then we spin them down. And then also our negative control, we inoculate with PBS. And so we want things to be consistent, but it's just the cells themselves that are different and not like, you know, media components and whatnot. Um, and so, so that part was fairly straightforward for us. The, the, the biggest challenge for us was the, was the SQL contents. Um, trying to enumerate that and, and feel comfortable with that, that number that we got. You know, we grew our defined community on BHI. And, you know, you can grow SQL contents on BHI, but you're going to underrepresent the actual number of cells there. And so we sort of like just accepted that that's going to be a limitation um, that we can enumerate and, you know, dilute it down to the concentration we want it. But it's probably m much more than that that we're actually giving the animals because, you know, the limitation of being able to enumerate a, an undefined complex community versus, you know, those individual cultures. But at the time, it felt like the best sort of thing for us to do as far as trying to standardize it with the knowledge that it, it, it wasn't going to be a limitation. I have the, just a couple questions. So one, when you are you have the increased richness as the chickens get older, have you identified those taxa and what functions they might be bringing to the table yeah. that are critical? Yeah, we, we have uh, identified the taxa. I had a former graduate student, Joel Mackey, that did some succession studies looking at, um, you know, ASVs coming from the eggs, from the environment, and then generally what like was colonizing as they got older. So, you know, understanding, I guess, that the taxa is, is um, somewhat clear to us, but the, the functional part is not clear to us, like what they're doing in the gut, what their niche is, uh, what they're functionally contributing to that environment. You know, a lot of that is unknown to us. So then the second question, going back to the SQL content, have you thought about also trying a dilution to drop out taxa and get to the point where the SQL content no longer works and sort of see where that threshold is? Yeah. Yeah, interesting. So, so just dilute it, reducing the diversity and seeing if you still have the, the effect. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. We... Um, have limitations in you know how many animal studies we can feasibly do, and so we've been trying to test some variables in chemostats as sort of a proxy for what's happening in the animal. And so perhaps that could be a place to do it. Uh, we can you know put SQL contents in there. Uh, we do lose diversity because it's like an in vitro setup. You know it's on BHI, and so we lose a lot of organisms, um, and we do still get prevention of colonization in the in the vessel with Salmonella. And so we've been focusing on who, who we lost and who is still there so that we can reduce at least our, our list of wish we had organisms to include in, in our defined community. So that's sort of been the approach we've been taking. But yeah, diluting it down could be a, an interesting way to also get rid of a little bit of that noise and, and get it down to just, I mean, essentially what you'll be looking at are the most abundant organisms then, seeing if those can do it. So, so the chickens, I'm not that familiar with the bird physiology. So the chickens have two cica, 
print. So when you're doing this study, you take them and pool both. We do. We you never have enough SQL contents. Yeah. yeah. So you like you want it all. And so yeah, we typically yeah take them both out, cut them, put them in a in a tube. And so yeah, I was just interested in like how similar the communities stay in between the two within yeah. the same bird, like like the particularly when you're putting in defined communities and stuff like that, the stochasticity of the yeah. colonization would be a bit different between the two, but then everything else is going to be identical. Yeah. I think I saw one paper looking at the the Sika to Sika variation uh, or the uh, Sikum Sika variation within an animal. And I think they they concluded they're fairly similar. I've, I've also had the same question because because it's not like a continuous flow through organ, they fill and then they 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 sort of uh, express back into like the colon and then that then it passes. And so are they doing it at the same time? You know, or do they each have a mind of their own? And then then there's like a little mini succession that occurs when it refills with digesta, and then you have like the anaerobe sort of like you know take over um, before then the next expression of that. I've, I've, when you're doing necropsies all day, you sit there and you think about like what is this? <laughs> what does the Sika think? You know, and you know it. Yeah, it's stuff that keeps me up at night. But it's a good question. I don't know really. Like, yeah. I think just following up with uh, questions that they had, like if you eventually dilute that, wouldn't you end up with like the most strict anaerobes of the Sika content? And would that be successful to inoculate day old chickens with those microbes? Do you think that you would have a successful colonization of the Sika when the micro environment is not very well like anaerobic? Yeah, per se. Yeah, so that was yeah a big unknown when we first tried this. You know, like will they colonize? I, I think there's there's like a difference between colonization and thriving, right? I do think that they don't thrive until um, you know that community develops and you get more um, of the facultative anaerobes to you know reduce that environment, and then the anaerobes can take over. And so um, you know we were hoping that uh, we. We could include, you know, some of those facultative anaerobes. There are also a lot of facultative anaerobes already there, um, and so can we like speed up the process? But um, right after, or at least I guess that was a a, a week after uh, inoculating the the defined community, we do see them pretty abundant there. And so, um, you know, I do think though after a week, the the, the gut environment is starting to get more anaerobic. Um, Chicken gut is also, I think there's more oxygen than maybe like a, a larger intestinal tract. You know, in the ileum, you have a lot of those, those aerotolerant organisms. And so, um, you know, I think that they have some ability to, to manage that system. The, but the Sika, you know, we were able to get them to colonize. But that is a good question whether or not if you sort of try to leap over that succession process that happens, can you get them to colonize or is that process necessary to get, you know, some of these strict anaerobes to colonize? And, and I, and I think you can, it's just, um, yeah, whether or not they're contributing metabolically very much in, a, in an oxygen environment, or if they're just sort of, you know, managing to get by until it, it gets more hospitable to, you know, that being a strict in a room. I have a philosophical question to close. We've been trying to fight salmonella in chickens for like 70 years. And we can't get rid of it. Like you can get rid of Cerevar A, Cerevar B takes over. What is the ecological um, service that it's doing to the chicken? And could we try to target it at that way, finding something else that pr produces the same service? Because it colonizes the Sika, but it is not a strict anaerobe, right? So what the hell is Salmonella doing in chicken intestinal function that we can't get rid of it? Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's a good question. I don't, I don't know the answer. Some, some, I, I think Ade once told me he's like his chickens love salmonella. You know, they're like happy, they're healthy, and so if if they're not contributing at minimum, they're probably not uh, creating a cost for the chicken. Because they know. don't kill the chickens either, right? No, you don't. They're you don't see chicken. disease. You don't see pathology. Um, you know, um, yeah, they look happy. Uh, you know, no inflammation. So. Um, so I think it's a commensalistic relationship that they have with chickens, you know, like Campylobacter is the same. 
Um, and so they, they cause problems in humans, but not in chickens. And so I think that's the challenge in like, you know, trying to break that commensalistic relationship and, you know, get the chicken to recognize it as, as a pathogen that's, you know, vaccine strategies are based on, um, you know, and then. You know, and they don't work either. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, they work for the, the, the serovar that, yeah, they're vaccinating against, but it's definitely not broad protection. But if you if you ask somebody from Finland, they would say they'd have no uh, no salmonella problem because they use um, that Avagard product, you know, and they their regulators allow them to use it and they'll flat out say, we don't have salmonella. Because they are putting something that's taking the ecological niche that salmonella yes. takes in the U.S. Yes, and so find that thing. Yeah. Uh, I was just curious. Oh, yeah. um, have you thought, have you looked at all at the virome associated with salmonella? Because I know that there are like jumbo phages, um, salmonella jumbo phages that are polyvalent. Um, so they target more than just salmonella. So I don't know if like anyone's looked at that or seen if maybe there's like some type of like competition or something that where salmonella is like the virome from salmonella is kind of contributing to its ability to hang out a little bit. Yeah, I haven't I haven't thought about uh, yeah salmonella virome uh, or or phages. I have a colleague, uh, Sean Beerson, who has looked at phage as facilitators for gene transfer. Um, but that's the extent of my sort of, you know, knowledge, you know, uh, of, of her research um, related to that. Um, but yeah, that's that's a good comment that it's you know these these bacteria don't exist in a vacuum. You know, there there are other contributors to that ecosystem. Well, let's thank Dr. Santino.